So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Muscanet Kong Watershed Association or the MWA uh, or this River Talk series that this is a part of, I did want to give a little introduction. Uh, we at the MWA are an independent nonprofit organization and uh, we exist, we're dedicated to protecting and improving the quality of the Muscanet Kong River and its watershed, including its natural and cultural resources. So um, in a nutshell, we care not only about the river, but also the watershed, meaning the land surrounding the Muscanet Kong River, because we want the entire community, um, not just the organisms that depend on the river, but natural spaces, the people living in it. We want there to be a nice balance. We want there to be a thriving community. Um, acknowledging that we're all part of the same system. So we do this through a number of means. We have volunteer and uh, professional level water quality monitoring. We have a robust education program in schools, um, general public, such as something like we're doing tonight. Um, we encourage uh, usage of our outdoor recreational spaces, public spaces. Uh, we do a lot of environmental restoration. Uh, dam removals is what we've come to be known for. Uh, but also uh, restoration projects such as tree plantings and other things. Um, and so if any of these avenues resonate with you, of course, we want to hear from you. Uh, nearly all of our work is supported through volunteer efforts. So um, if you're interested in any of that or have any questions regarding those programs, please reach out to me um, before or, or uh, you know, after this, this talk. Um, but I did want to get into uh, tonight's talk. We'll be learning about the En-ROADS Climate Change Simulator which is an online tool that explores possible solutions for climate change. So um, anyone can use this. It's a free online software and it allows you to create these global scenarios, um, uh, adopting different policies in different sectors of society, such as energy supply, building, transportation, land use, things like that. And the model is actually calibrated uh, to different scientific and business-based models and so that allows you to see what those interactions are between uh, different, different policies or different behaviors. And so the En-ROAD simulator really is a, a nice tool uh, for teaching purposes, but also for, for uh, exploration purposes. Um, so how this is gonna work, the nuts and bolts of, of the evening is that um, our speaker, Susan Golden, will be starting with a presentation uh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes just explaining some background information on climate change, uh, as well as a little introduction into the En-ROADS modeling tool. And then we'll actually go into the workshop-based portion of this. It will be interactive. There will be uh, chances to ask questions, chances to discuss, um, but I will just mute everybody from the start uh, so that um, Susan's uh, microphone is the only one coming through. Because um, that first part will just be more or less presentation. And then as we get into the interactive part, um, if you have questions, um, feel free to, to use the, the raise hand feature uh, on Zoom. Or if you want, you can also use the chat box if, if you don't uh, want to speak up necessarily, but still want to make a point or ask a question. And I will be monitoring that. Susan will be monitoring it, but um, you know she'll be trying to juggle multiple things at, at that time. So um, if you see something that, uh, you know, if you see that you're not being attended to, maybe just add another message in the chat and, and we'll be sure to, to uh, get around to you. But we do want these discussions and comments to be happening in real time as, as Susan is going through different scenarios or, or different uh, actions in the model. Um, and so when that's all done, we'll do a little bit of debrief again. It'll be a little bit more discussion-based. So. Um, with that, uh, that should probably take us to about 8.30. Um, and so at this point, I'd like to get started and present uh, our speaker tonight, Susan Golden. She is a retired STEM teacher and she now uh, works more on the, the freelance level. She speaks throughout the Northeast on climate change and other environmental issues, such as sustainability, pollution and water. She's trained with several environmental organizations and completed the Rutgers Environmental Stewardship Program uh, Susan has created several different presentations and workshops that she delivers regularly to schools and community groups, uh, not just locally, but around the world. And uh, in 2020, she became an En-ROADS ambassador uh, for the climate initiative um, related to what we're doing tonight. Um, Susan's also a member of the Climate Reality Project Leadership Corps, 
and serves on the board of directors for the Hackensack Riverkeeper and the Tenafly Nature Center. So very active in New Jersey and beyond. Um, Susan, very thankful for you to uh, be able to take this time with us. And uh, well, that's it, I'll, I'll send it over to you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. It's really my pleasure to be here. This is what I love to do. Um, as Ryan mentioned, uh, my climate story, I was a high school science and math teacher for about 15 years. And it was when I started teaching environmental science that I realized how little most of us know about uh, the interaction between nature and society. And only the few kids in my two sections of the class were the only ones really learning about this. So it became my passion to reach out to try to help more people understand how, um, how we use this planet uh, for modern society and in modern ways. And so thank you for having me here tonight. And um, uh, this is a great opportunity. This is one of my favorite events, partly because it's interactive. I'm actually not thrilled being a lecturer. So, but I am going to start with a few minutes introduction. And so let me get set up to share my screen here. Um, again, if you have any questions, uh, R. Cotton, do you have, I see your hands raised already. Do you have a question by any chance? No, malfunction. I apologize. No problem. Thanks. Okay. So, um, Ryan, I can't see everybody right now, but I can see you. Can you see my slide, S Education, S Golden Education? Yeah, it looks good. Thanks cool. for checking. So, thank you. So that's me. Uh, you can go and check out my website. I made it. Uh, learn about some of the other presentations I do, um, why I do this. Uh, but tonight we're going to talk about En-ROADS. And Ryan gave a pretty good introduction uh, about it. It's um, This is what the main window opens up to. And it was built uh, for policymakers, educators, business people, and legislators and uh, government people around the world. It's been presented around the world. And uh, we're gonna take a look at it tonight too. But I wanna start at the beginning and make sure that we all have the basic understanding. And uh, every time I give a climate presentation, I go on to, um, the website nasa.gov, I go to climate.nasa.gov and um, I look at their climate dashboard. And unfortunately, most of these numbers are changing in the wrong direction. But as it stands today, um, there's a concentration of 417 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that is the highest that they've uh, found in the atmosphere for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, certainly in the current era. Uh, the last 10,000 years, it's way higher. Um, the global temperature since 1880 has already increased by over one Celsius degree, and that's actually over two Fahrenheit degrees, so over two degrees. And that's a global average. Uh, different places have warmed up to different amounts. Uh, and sea level is rising and continues to rise and is speeding up. Uh, faster. So this is just the rate at which it's rising. And I'm going to mention a little bit about that in a few minutes. And unfortunately, the ice sheets are melting and the major two major areas on the planet that have ice sheets are generally uh, Greenland and Antarctica, and they are melting at incredible, incredible rates. So this is where it stands uh, today. And the cause you pretty unanimously agreed upon for this uh, global warming is that uh, carbon dioxide concentration as well as the green other greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere. And uh, they are increasing, the concentration is increasing and the planet is warming up. And so this is from the EPA, this little infographic, and I know it's a little wordy, but just, just to give quick background, Basically, the energy comes from the sun and it hits the Earth's surface, the land and the water. It also hits the atmosphere. And much of that energy is absorbed by uh, the land, the air and the sea. But some of it's radiated back into outer space. And some of it is trapped by our atmosphere and bounces back to the planet and keeps the planet warm. And just like in a greenhouse, and thus the name, we want a little greenhouse effect. We've had a greenhouse effect, a very stable one for the last 10,000 years or so. 
And that greenhouse effect actually has helped keep the, temp the climate at a stable temperate level. Carl Sagan uh, was said something like a little greenhouse is a good thing. I think you can find that in Cosmos. But we're adding, and since the industrial era, since the uh, steam engine really in a way, we're adding more and more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And so it's trapping them, more of them, and the planet is warming up. So I made this graphic for my middle schoolers. It's like we're putting a blanket on the planet. The blanket though is these invisible greenhouse gases and the planet's getting warmer. If you think about it, we as a society have taken certain compounds out of the planet, out of the inside and out of even the surface, and we've dumped them into the atmosphere and they are having a tremendous effect. And the four biggest uh, impact or uh, gases that are having the biggest impacts are uh, carbon dioxide, the chlorofluorocarbons and hydrofluorocarbons, um, methane and nitrous oxide as well. So these are uh, having the biggest um, effect and we generally look at carbon dioxide because we as a society emit much greater amounts of that than any of the other gases. But some of these are even more uh, stronger greenhouse gases than carbon dioxide. So they ought to be addressed. And if you are uh, economically minded, this is um, generally what the uh, scientific community is uh, thinks are the um, different emissions by sector. So uh, electricity, agriculture, and land use, which includes deforestation and industry, uh, they all, um, just those three sectors, emit almost 75% of all the greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, we're not gonna take a look at that too much tonight. Uh, we, that would be a another topic, but those emissions and global warming are having an impact already on the planet. And you must have uh, felt it somehow and it's affecting the biosphere or the top of the planet that the surface of the planet where all the organisms live in all these different ways and i don't have time to go into many of these tonight or much of this i just want to point out that climate change is changing weather patterns around the world and some areas are having more droughts and heat waves this dirt is so dry that it's cracked as you can see right here um, and the microbes in it, of course, are dead when it gets like that. So even once water returns, they still have to restore the microbial ecosystem before that will really be productive farmland. And then some storms are becoming bigger and uh, we're seeing them more frequently as well. Because of global warming and climate change, sea level is rising. And here in New York and New Jersey, it's rising faster than the global average. So this graph is from Rutgers. And this line here is sea level in 1920. And this black line that's slowly rising is the sea level, global sea level average uh, at any date since then. And the brown and green is actual real data. Uh, green is average along the New Jersey shore and the brown is New York City. And it's tide gauge data as well as satellite data. Uh, that they made this. And you can see that sea level since 1920 has already risen over a foot here in New Jersey, and it continues to rise. Uh, actually, probably at a, this looks like it's a faster rate than um, the global increase. So let's take a quick look at some of these other effects though, but because of sea level rising, not only do that, does that have a bigger effect on storms, but even when it's not storming, we see that more tidal flooding as you see here in downtown Miami Beach, where they actually have spent millions of dollars to raise the level of some of the streets down there to prevent this. But it's, there's also tidal flooding in developing countries and Bangladesh, which most of the country is only a meter above sea level. Um, what are these people supposed to do as their earthen dam uh, gets over uh, burdened, as you see, it got burst when this river uh, overflowed over a hundred villages got flooded this weekend due to high tides. This was in 2014. Also, uh, the global warming is affecting uh, our oceans as well. And of course they cover 70% of the planet. They've absorbed uh, much of the heat that actually we're trapping. Most of it is in the ocean uh, and they're becoming warmer. 
They're also becoming more acidic because not only is it absorbing the heat, but the carbon dioxide as well. And when carbon dioxide dissolves in the water, it becomes carbonic acid. Uh, they're becoming less salty because of the, that ice sheet, those ice sheets melting in Greenland and Antarctica. And as I mentioned a minute ago, sea level is also rising. So those are some of the effects of climate change on the ocean in just a moment. Uh, I don't have time to go into this because I want to look more at the solutions, but climate change is also affecting our global food supply. And there are numerous reports of studies in this area in all these different topics. And of course, here and also other industrialized countries, we're able to use um, technological methods such as more fertilizer or more irrigation uh, to overcome, to compensate for some issues, whereas in mostly subsistence farmers, of course, are much more prone to problems in these areas. But all these different areas end up affecting human health as, as well as the other health of the other organisms on the planet. And so we really, um, and again, this also is exacerbated in developing countries that don't have access to the modern technologies we have. And I know I went through that super fast. <laughs> I think I'm breaking a record here. Uh, and if you'd like, I could come another day. I have a whole presentation on global warming and what we can do to mitigate it. But again, I'd like to move on. Uh, we're more interested tonight in the solutions. And really it's agreed upon throughout uh, the, scientific community that the solution to, to global warming is to stop emitting greenhouse gases and to remove them from the atmosphere. We need to stop emitting them and to reduce the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So what does that look like and what can we do to achieve it? So that's what we're gonna do for the rest of the evening. And, but before we go into that simulator, I wanna talk about what this looks like. And the metaphor of a bathtub, I, I just happen to love it. It makes so much sense. So unknowingly for much of, uh, since the industrial revolution, we have been emitting carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere at an increasing rate, unfortunately. And we have really had the drain plugged. The only thing that has been pulling any of this out are trees and uh, other natural uh, substances that undergo photosynthesis. So um, we've pretty much had no drain and we've been pouring these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So what's happening? The bathtub is filling up. And uh, as a consequence, as the bathtub fills up, the planet warms up. So while that's a really great graphic and all, let's just take a little uh, different look at this in a more adult manner. And this would be graphically. And while this graph is carbon dioxide emissions and removals, it's pretty much essentially the same as all greenhouse gases. And you can see that over time, if we don't do anything, we will continue to emit greenhouse uh, carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. And as long as we are emitting more, then we are removing them. And that's this blue line, as opposed to the red line, as long as the red line's above the blue line, the greenhouse gas concentration will continue to go up and the planet will continue to warm. So, but what our goal is, uh, we want to meet uh, the Paris Accord and try to stop global warming at 1.5 degrees at Celsius. And what we have to do in order to meet that is to actually take our carbon dioxide emissions and bring our emissions below our removals. And once we do that, we will bring, uh, that will help the science and the models show that we will be able to stop global warming and possibly even, uh, get it to come down again, but definitely stop global warming. As we, but we have to get those emissions below those removals. And that's what we're going to try to do today. We're gonna to try to meet uh, the Paris Accord of only 1.5 degree warming. And to do that, we're going to use this really cool simulator En-ROADS. When I, I first saw it, I fell in love with it. I knew I had to learn more. I took their training at Climate Interactive and I became an ambassador and now we're here tonight. But before we go into it, I'd like to just give you a little bit, uh, Ryan did a very good job of an introduction for it, uh, but quickly it was developed by Climate Interactive and Tana Systems and MIT Management uh, Sloan Sustainability Initiative. And it was uh, grounded in the best available science. They continue to monitor and update it. They issue updates every month. 
It's been calibrated against a wide range of existing integrated assessment climate and energy models. And so this graph shows you uh, just how they do it. Um, it's their baseline, which is the bright blue, is the En-ROADS baseline. We'll be using that. And it's pretty much right in the middle of these dashed lines. And these dotted and dashed lines represent the uh, other, several other um, well-known, well-respected climate models. And you can see En-ROADS took a conservative approach and pretty much right down the middle. You'll notice that all these models are uh, pretty much identical down here at the left of the graph. Why? Because they're all based on the same historic data. What did happen? So they all model what did happen properly. And so as they go on to look at scenarios and predict what happens, that's where these models tend to diverge. The farther out in the future is more uh, uncertain. So rather than make predictions, En-ROADS like to say, say that they are talking about possible scenarios. So we're gonna be looking at some of them and we're going to do our best to get this uh, temperature change to not continue to go up. But um, I have this slide here because I don't know where else to put it. If you're interested and pursue some more information from Climate Interactive, uh, about En-ROADS, they have lots and lots of resources, control panels, so you can review some of the information on the screen, a whole facilitator's guide, student assignments to use in a classroom that you don't have to make your own yourself, lots of training videos and webinars, and even slides similar to the ones you're seeing tonight, uh, so you can create a, a presentation just like I'm giving you. So this is uh, when you hit the En-ROADS uh, link that I'm gonna put in later, uh, this is the first screen you'll get. Uh, you'll get. Um, but I think now, uh, as a matter of fact, we're going to go into that. If there have any questions as I bring that up, I'm going to stop sharing here and go into uh, N roads. One second. Okay, so now you should see En-ROADS, and this is their main screen. So this is a free, um, a free application, and uh, Steve W. is my husband. Thank you, Steve, for your help. And he posted that HTTPS En-ROADS Climate Interactive, that will get you posted to the screen, and you can see the simulation by, for yourself and play with it for yourself. Hopefully we can work together for a while though. So this is the screen, I could give you a quick tour. Um, this is a very open software. So if you ever wanna know anything about it, um, you can go into the simulation and look at their assumptions even. And they leave it that many of them can be modified if you don't agree with uh, some of the basics that they're uh, basing their uh, computations on. You can actually modify them. Although they have some pretty good, all their sources are pretty much peer reviewed or uh, published documents. And they uh, list many of them as well, right here. And we'll look at that. We can go through many graphs and we'll be looking at a whole bunch of them. These are whole different uh, uh, topics of graphs and there are over 95 of them here. As a matter of fact, I'm going to, uh, the one I wanna show you is temperature change. And there are two graphs always on the screen at the same time. And it also tells us our predicted, it's not predicted, a possible temperature increase by 2100. And we are going to work in Celsius, with, and that's 3.6 degrees, although that's over 6 degrees Fahrenheit. And I pulled up this graph on the right because I wanted you to see that our goal is to get these dotted lines represent the Paris Accord. And our goal tonight is to choose actions in these different sectors of the economy and uh, try to get this blue line to come in between the two dotted lines. So the black line, when you see a graph like this, the black line is the baseline. What happens if we don't do anything? And right now we're on track to hit 3.6 degrees at the end of the century. And the blue line is what we want to make change. And if I just move one slider, you can see that that blue line uh, changed a little. I dropped our temperature um, by 0.2 degrees. So we're aiming to get this down to 1.5 or at least two. We can see what I, I just 
highly subsidized renewables is what I did as an example. And up at the top, one of the best favorite buttons they have is replay and it goes into replay. And you see, as I move the slider, uh, the graphs move, which is very cool in several different ways. So uh, we can also always reset the graphs so that we're looking at um, uh, not the temperature, but the original ones, which are greenhouse gas net emissions. And you see, as I uh, increased my renewables, my greenhouse gas emissions went down. And I can also reset my policies so we can start over again if we need to. I find that it's always good to know how to reset. So in a moment, I would love to hear input from you on some actions we can take to try to draw that down. And you're gonna guide me in, the, in this discussion tonight. And if you don't want to speak up, if you could um, put it in the chat, that would be great. And we're gonna take actions on energy supply, on fossil fuel use and renewables, possibly a new technology, uh, some policies like possibly carbon pricing. We'll look at transportation, buildings and industry. Uh, if we want to manipulate growth, in policies, as well as land and industry emissions and how we can stop them and specific carbon removal methods, both natural and uh, technological. So uh, with that, I'm actually going to open the discussion up a little. And is there something that, that you've heard of that will help us bring the temperature down? Uh, and I'll start explaining more things from that. Uh, you could put it in the chat. In the meantime, um, this graph on the left is global sources of primary energy, and it's an area graph. So the thickness of each area gives you an idea of how much is being used. And brown is coal, red is oil, blue is gas, uh, green is all renewables bundled together, wind, solar, geothermal, and hydro. Bioenergy is uh, when you grow things, uh, to try to trap the uh, carbon, um, nuclear power, and then a possible new technology. People always say, what happens if we develop, uh, for instance, thorium fish fusion, for example. So I see Bill has typed uh, that we could try to do um, smaller modular reactors and uh, use nuclear power uh, definitely replace fossil fuels with uh, nuclear power. That is. Uh, Definitely a choice that many people in the energy industry think is uh, going to be important to do. And so I highly subsidized um, nuclear reactors. So you can see that the use of them increased. Let me replay that. And, uh, but it only dropped us one tenth of a degree. And you'll notice that I couldn't really uh, make this much bigger than you see there. And we can find out exactly how much I did it. I see somebody mentioned methane too. So we can remove some methane. Just I'm gonna talk about nuclear for a moment. And one of the really cool things, let me do that again, is every one of these sliders. So if you wanna just move sliders and see what it does and move the pretty lines, that's cool. And I do that a lot with middle schoolers. But if you wanna learn at another layer, you click one of these vertical three dots and up comes a whole bottom new bottom half. And here we're gonna subsidize uh, nuclear power plants but we need to recognize too, and if you're a real politician or legislator and you want to see what a real policy might look like, you can use uh, particular numbers. What if we have a nuclear breakthrough to reduce the costs, et cetera? And you get more information to the right. So these are what they call detail sliders and we can change them and we can look at different graphs. So here's, because we subsidized it, we have more of a demand just for nuclear power and we're seeing it here. But notice we subsidized it now and we're not really reaping the benefits of it yet for still another 10 years or so because they'd have to build up. That's if we did it on a global basis, it'd still have to ramp up. There are other different uh, graphs that you can see. So I can technically, I'm looking at three different graphs right now. And, uh, but even better, uh, if you click the I button for information, they give examples for every slider, the big message, and nuclear is not a huge driver of future temperature and competes with the growth of renewables and other new carbon uh, technology, new net, new zero carbon technologies. And it could be a part of a suite of climate actions. 
but uh, you know, there are environmental costs. And this is something that we try to think about as we look at our choices here. So they're bringing up the fact that we would have waste materials, risky waste materials and the risk of radiation damage near the plants as we just saw at Fukushima just a few years ago. So the graph also talks about key dynamics. Um, also with every slider, we talk about co-benefits and of, this is of discouraging nuclear. We just uh, subsidized it, so I'm not going to read that. And there are, of course, equity considerations as well. Um, and they tell us what the slider settings are. So when we move this to, uh, we subsidized it, we're going to subsidize it with seven cents uh, per kilowatt hour. And we can, um, we can slide it in different ways and we can change the assumptions. And here's where they get their information. So if you'd like to go and check up on them. So uh, I increased nuclear, that dropped us down one tenth of a degree, that's great. And I agree now with Ken, uh, thank you for your input. Let's drop some methane. So Ken, I'm gonna ask you, what do you have any idea of where we should drop that methane from? What are some of the biggest sources? Well, clearly the use of natural gas, uh, uh, which leaks uh, you know, at every stage of its uh, development process, development and, and delivery process. Um, landfills is also pretty big. It'd be interesting to see how much we are actually, you know, seeing in terms of uh, methane from landfills versus uh, the gas infrastructure problem. Okay, well, that's a good point. And I can do that uh, separately so we can do a real comparison. This is a systems integrated approach. It's a great point, and we're going to look at them. Um, so these things interact with each other. So actually, what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to reset everything and let's just take a look at what happens if we, do we want to tax natural gas, this being an economics model, or do we want to actually try to stop using it altogether? What do you think we should do? Um, we should stop using it altogether. Tax schemes don't work. I agree. So what I had to do is I went in those, that vertical thing and I'm going in the, this is the main slider. And I'm coming down and I go down and sure enough, per, uh, percent reduction. Well, let me see something here. This is even better yet. Stop building new infrastructure. We'll stop that. And we're going to uh, reduce our gas utilization, hopefully by 100% as fast as we can. And that shot us uh, way down to zero. It still takes about 10 years. When do we get there? 31. So it's going to take nine or 10 years just to get there. And yeah, we're going to stop that, that's a pretty it. big challenge, but okay. <laughs> well, if you would like, I tell here we have a choice. Look at we can start. When should we be done? Uh, no, we want to. We want to keep doing it. Yeah. Right? Okay. We well, I, to, yeah, that's a great tool. I I, I understand. So with, well, that's if we stop using natural gas. But actually, I, what I'd like to point out is what happened to. Uh, I'd like to take a look at these graphs now. You notice that the blue went away, which is very cool because we stopped using natural gas. But let me see what happens. Yeah, that's what I thought. One second. Let me set this so I can set it up the way I want. This is it. Yeah, so what happens to these other things when I uh, actually turn off that? Yes. What's happening to the brown and the orange? Can you tell? Are those going up? Yeah, actually, they both went up. Very funky what's going on here. Yeah, why isn't the green you know, going up? Or why is isn't green? the green going up? Yeah, Interesting. Right. Well, we didn't, we're not subsidizing renewables at the moment, are we? And generally, we already hear part of the issue. It's a good, those are excellent questions. And I think most of the question, green is increasing, just not at an increasing rate. But we already have the infrastructure for coal and oil. And so the natural gas is actually being replaced more. This is called the rebound effect, a systems and a feedback. We're replacing the natural gas now with two other fossil fuels. And I'm just going to uh, reset, actually I can do it here. I'm going to reset this for a minute just so I can get it. I wanna get it cleaner. There. Now, if I replay it, you should be able to see. So there it is naturally. And then the red and mostly mm -hmm. the brown is growing. Right. Because we're replacing natural gas. Because what has happened recently is natural gas has replaced coal, and natural gas is a cleaner 
uh, burning thing. So people around the world are using coal. So more. Um, is there anything else? I mean, we don't really want, I'll go back to the landfills and all. Well, how much does, how much, how does the model take into account the fact that renewables like solar and wind, you know, are now cheaper basically um, in most parts of the world than uh, fossil fuels? Is it only based on tax incentives or doesn't, or does it have a predictor in terms of they, the uh, improving costs of renewables? Because the cost of fossil fuels, other than the fuel itself, is pretty static. The technology isn't going to change. Uh, yes, you're right. Hold on a second. Uh, I know what you're asking. You're at, wait, you're asking about costs, right? Yeah. So hang on. I know it's somewhere. <laughs> Geothermal renewables. So these are the costs. These are the predictions of the marginal costs of production mm -hmm. of all of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the renewables somewhere in here is should be uh, my source. Here you go. This is this mimic, this models the others. So in some places, wind and solar is cheaper and becoming cheaper than the other uh, sources right. of electricity and energy. So that's where it is modeling that information and they go by market price. Um, let's see, you know, each, each graph also has a thing. And I don't know that um, the costs uh, they got uh, from a source and this course cost is adjusted for taxes, subsidies, et cetera. So, uh, and then it's a marginal cost. It's an assessment of what it would cost to produce electricity from a new facility and can differ from the average cost of electricity production because it doesn't factor in the costs to produce electricity from existing facilities. So this is growing it. Yeah. This is the difference between marginal and average, which means that I should go and see if I can find average, but I don't. So, um, yeah, this is just the total cost of energy. And right now it looks like it's gonna go up at the moment, but I don't think we're done yet. So I'm going to put this back to um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions for now, which is the basic. And I'd like to hear, so we're gonna stop using natural gas and you wanted to compare that to methane. If, uh, if I look at just reducing methane from other sources, then up here we go into land and industry emissions. And like you said, there's landfills. And I also saw Car uh, somebody else mentioned in the chat that methane is also um, from, it's from agricultural waste and landfills. And pretty much anything that is uh, vegetative as it's decomposing or organic, it emits methane. And again, we go into the detailed settings and right here, this is about reducing our agricultural and waste emissions. Not only methane, they do have a bundled methane and um, nitrous oxide, which is uh, from fertilizers. So they're saying that we can only reduce uh, so much. We're never mm -hmm. going to reduce all the methane emissions that we have. We could uh, emit more from industry, like stop making uh, cement and other things, of, finding other ways to do it. And if we really curbed it down, then we're down to, uh, at the end of the century, only seven gigatons as opposed to 25 of methane and nitrous oxide, at least. This also has some F gases in it. So uh, you can see there, and by doing that, I still only brought down the temperature by how much? Three tenths of a degree. So we're, but we did bring down some greenhouse gas net emissions. So that's good. So that, that's the methane picture there. And now if I combine the two, let's see what we got. If we really start, no, we didn't want to do that. Sorry. If we really start attacking this, right? So now we got rid of most of the methane and between the two of them, we're down to three degrees. So we dropped 0.6, but as you can see here, we're generating a lot of our energy from coal still, which is the dirtiest fossil fuel, as well as oil. Now oil is, includes what we think of as gasoline, like for our cars and trans, this is, the red represents transportation primarily and some residential and commercial. And then there's coal. And of course, renewables is still big, but not as big as it could be. So, uh, Anything, somebody here is mentioning a carbon tax. Uh, Matt, is it? 
So you, do you know about carbon taxes? You wanna mention what that is? Uh, I can do it. Well, is that something you'd like me to do is put a price on carbon in general? Um, can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> Um, yeah, well, it depends upon what your goal is. If, if, if your goal is to uh, reduce carbon as much as you can, you would need a pretty hefty price, or at least you would need to build one or, or, you know, over the years and forecast you know, what it might look like so people have a chance to adjust to it. And then there's varieties to make it more politically acceptable by rebating much of it to, to uh, you know, people who don't have a lot of money so it doesn't, doesn't hit, hurt them that badly. But if you're looking to change uh, a lot of behavior, which is what this really is all about, you know, there isn't, I can't think of any one thing that's more powerful than a carbon tax. Well, there are quite a few people who agree with you, particularly uh, Citizens Climate Lobby. They've been pushing for it. There are, um, there are over 64 different countries or regions in the world that already have some form of a carbon tax in place. And mm -hmm. Um, we can put a tax on carbon, and uh, which will impact all three fossil fuels at the same time. And since coal is the most carbon intensive, it's going to affect that most. So if, you, if I highly put a high price on it, you saw how coal in particular really shut down, so did oil. And uh, you'll notice that the renewables actually increased. Why? Because we need to get that energy from somewhere. So even though I didn't um, subsidize the renewables, uh, renewables, still my use increased. So this is a carbon price and we can look, Matt, at how big it is and that they're saying we, we just put a huge hefty price, you're right, of $250 a ton wow. on carbon dioxide. And we did that in a matter of a decade or so, 10 years we wrote. So that might not be fair uh, to a lot of people, but <laughs> Um, we can, if we were trying to look at some real policy, again, we can, uh, the climate, let's see, the climate, uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, they want to start with an initial price. If I go to try to model their thing, they want a price to start uh, right away. Um, and they want it to go from 10, like $15, I think it was. I can look it up again, $15 a ton and up to $150 a ton. Let's see, we wanna start achieving that now. And that would take uh, 10 years or so to get there. We actually have a carbon tax in New Jersey now, we just don't call it that. Um, and it's very, very modest. It's, it's, it's what funds Reggie. And the purpose is not to reduce carbon, it's so much as it's to raise revenue that could be funneled back to support renewables and things like that. Excellent, well, that's another, that's one of the bills facing the Senate, the, the federal government too, is to put a carbon tax. And they talk about uh, to, to um, uh, collect the revenues in the tax. And like you said, 25% of it would go to infrastructure, clean infrastructure and to pay for the bill and then to distribute 75% of it to all households evenly across the country, which would hopefully help pay for the electricity. Because uh, I mentioned super quickly in the intro, one of the things this helps us look at is um, co-benefits and other equity concerns. And if we look at the cost of energy, when we put a carbon price on, uh, on all those different fossil fuels, look at what happens to the cost of energy, at least initially, it really shoots up. And so one has to ask yourself, what happens in, a, in those communities where they are low income or marginalized? Uh, how can we help them? And uh, by distributing this carbon tax is one of the ways that, that in Citizens Climate Lobby uh, is at least proposing that we do it, as well as some of the bills in the government. So those are excellent concerns and ideas. And uh, I also want to go back, let's go back and take a look at, um, oh, let me go to the area graph. That's the same graph as this, only this looks a little neater. So I just want to point out also how we really dropped down our coal use. That got down our greenhouse gas emissions. And by the way, look at our number now, we're at one, uh, 
action of moving to a carbon price, really a high carbon price, really brought down our temperature. We're pretty close um, to uh, our upper goal, but we're gonna go for the better goal. And uh, I did wanna point out one thing. I pointed out a concern in the cost of energy, but check out uh, what might happen if we can get people to stop using coal. Um, one of the things that's going to happen in particular as we go to clean energy sources is we're going to have healthier air. And here in New Jersey, maybe not so much in Asbury, but more so in Bergen County, where I live, with all our highways and our malls, we have a lot of ozone and a lot of pollution uh, from traffic. And it's actually transportation in the United States is one of the biggest sources of greenhouse gas emissions. And if we could make our tra traffic, uh, our transportation energy free, and if we can use no coal for heating, et cetera, uh, we really could bring down the air pollution levels. And of course that would make it uh, much healthier for anybody with respiratory problems. I've developed asthma since I've been here and uh, I lived in Seattle for 20 years and came back. And uh, many other people I know have asthma in the area and that's partly because of the, um, the particulate matter in the air. So by cleaning up climate change, we can also clean up air pollution, which would be awesome. And uh, hey, Matt, I do love the fact, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say on the, on the topic of air pollution, I did get a message here. Um, what's the effect of afforestation or, or adding forested land back and also diversifying plants in, in agricultural fields. Um, just thinking about things that help with the climate and also help with air. That's awesome. And they are, we can model some of them here as well. Uh, so you talked about afforestation. So here, afforestation does mean, I'm gonna go into the details again, it's planting new forests and restoring old forests. So this is the change in amount. And we're going to, uh, let's just say we plant everything we can. And this is kind of interesting. So this is the afforestation, as I mentioned earlier, what's our best right now, the best way that we're able to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere is all the vegetation around the world. It's the forests and the grasslands, and they are what's uh, really sequestering it. And unfortunately, it's also going into the oceans as well. So, um, but check this out. If we planted all the land available for afforestation, and that's just the maximum land that, that is not something plant, that something else isn't planted on, um, or it is in the city, for example. Uh, I wanna point out that if we start planting this year, look at when that's going to be pulling out most of the carbon dioxide. It's not gonna be until 2060, 2080, and 2100. So even if we plant a billion trees today, when are they, you know, a sapling pulls out, I don't know how much less than a, a huge oak tree, a beautiful oak in one of our forests, you know, like Stokes Forest, for example. So um, there takes, our choices take time to work as well. So I would like to just give you an idea too, though, when I talk about the percent available land this dotted line is the area of the sub of the country of India. So this is how much we're talking about planting almost twice the area of India in terms in the uh, in terms of plants in order to be pulling out. By the way, how much did this help us? I think it was only one tenth of a degree. So actually, afforestation, well, it does. Uh, and you'll notice here it didn't change our air. Well, this is because it's air pollution from energy. It's not modeling air pollution, although this is particulate matter. And the I don't know that the vegetation actually pulls out PM 2.5. Uh, that's not what it's known for, but I could check that. But anyway, it only dropped the temperature by one tenth of a degree. So actually afforestation, while it's a wonderful thing and we should try to do it, it, it doesn't turn out to be a high leverage action that we can take. Yeah, so, right. Susan, Go if ahead. I may, just, you know, one Please. thing to keep in mind is not all of our emissions, in fact, probably a small amount of our emissions have come from cutting down and burning trees. A lot of these emissions come from carbon that's been stored deep underground. So even if we went back to historical, you know, pre-industrial levels of forestation, um, 
you'd still have all the carbon that was previously underground, but has been burned through uh, fossil fuels. Absolutely. That's an excellent point. But we, so we're trying to, though, replant. In this case, we're replanting. And we still do have, while in this country, we don't see it much, except in um, you know, wildfires. But there are countries around the world, like Brazil and, um, and many places in Indonesia, where they're still doing deforestation and burning down their forests. And that's really, uh, well, that's reducing it. But if we increase deforestation or if we can get them to stop, that too, it's not a high leverage, but it still can help us to actually get down to 2.0 degrees. So we're just about there. Uh, we should soon... Yes, I agree that, um, that uh, we do need to accelerate our uh, ambitions and our goals and our transformation. We are transforming. Is there anything else that somebody's heard uh, about this that we can try or has been done? And Ken, there is a version, this comes in many different languages. Uh, here's the languages they've translated it to already. Just to remind you, this is a global simulation. So when we say, for example, that we're putting a carbon, a price on carbon, we're going to, we're pretending or assuming that the entire world is going to adopt this policy that they're going to um, put uh, a price of carbon on $150 per ton of carbon dioxide, which actually countries are doing, uh, some are doing close to that or have higher ambitions than that. So, um, and yes, the permafrost is melting, but that is not at the moment that is, you can uh, model that in this, but we're not looking at it. Um, we are not looking at the uh, model with that. Uh, damage turned on. So that would really just turns the temperature higher. I checked it out. So I don't feel like doing that. <laughs> That's not what we're looking at right now. If I could, if I could just jump in and ask, would the model for the US be different, for example, than the global model um, in terms of reducing, you know, when we took, took away gas, um, coal jumped up uh, dramatically. Um, you know, I suspect that that may be true globally. But I don't think it would happen in the U.S. I, you know, um, would the U.S. have have a different model for, for taking away uh, gas and replacing it with other other forms of uh, energy? Uh, it might. I don't. Uh, I don't know how I can answer that. Except when you to sit there and argue with your premise, and I don't mean to be terrible. But we have the reason we have switched to gas in our country is to get rid of coal. So if you were to say that now I have to get rid of gas, we don't have the infrastructure at the moment uh, to replace that gas. So when we shut down that gas, I have a feeling that they're just gonna start up the coal power plants. We still have on the Hackensack River, we have two coal power plants that, well, I don't know, as of a year ago, because I haven't been on the river this year, but they were still standing and they had shut them down and they were removing the coal from the property. But we, you know, there's a million people here in Bergen County anyway, and we need our power. So if they're going to stop the gas, then I sure, I even have to hope that they're going to turn something else on. So unless we have regulation and policy, the chances are it is going to go. Back well, to I, I just think it's important to understand what the assumptions would be, because, you know, I've seen a lot of, you know, articles about, uh, you know, utilities that were going to build, um, you know, gas plants and uh, realized that solar would be more cost effective. And even though there are a lot of gas plants on the drawing board, uh, solar has become, solar and batteries have knocked some of them out. And so I'm thinking a lot of, a lot of companies before they went back to coal are certainly going to take a look at solar. So I'm, I'm just saying, I don't want to argue, you know, whether that's true or not. I'm just saying before I would believe the results from this model, I'd have to see what the assumptions are in the United States for, you know, behind some of these. Well, and those can all be looked at that. There are reports, there are regional reports from the EPA, as a matter of fact, is an excellent source. If you wanna go read uh, about some of the, United, the things uh, unique to the United States, uh, they, NASA has some interesting things about it. So you can look into that. Generally, as you mentioned, we're subsidizing renewables even in this country. So, I'm going to subsidize them here on this uh, graph. 
And luckily, more and more places are adopting that. And you can see that as I did that, those renewables replaced mostly coal and a little bit of oil. And because it replaced coal, we got even the air pollution down even further than it was. And I don't think that we increased our costs much either. I'm going to uh, quickly jump to costs just to see uh, because of the price coming down. So I'm going to look at costs. And actually, by going to renewables, because the prices are coming down, you can see that that cost of energy comes down even faster. So. Yes, Ken, I, I'm agreeing with you too. And I agree that we need to look regionally and by country uh, too. But again, it's a global issue and, and this is a global model. So, uh, and here I see somebody talked about energy efficiency as overlooked. And uh, the En-ROADS definitely takes this into account. And um, uh, also Cindy mentioned uh, uh, energy efficiency. And in this country in particular, and many countries around the world, there is room, particularly uh, in buildings. Our buildings are built to look, first of all, the older buildings didn't have the technology, the standards, or the zoning that we have should have today. And so to, the opportunity to retrofit new buildings is uh, an industry as well. So if we just reduce our efficient or increase our efficiency, reduce our use of fuel, uh, you'll see that we dropped, did you see how fast that thing dropped? I'm gonna do that again. So the whole need for energy has dropped. I'm gonna go back to, uh, let's, let's go back to, and what happened to our greenhouse gas emissions? All of them, they've come down and as a whole. We can even look at how they uh, came down by different, by gas involved. Now you'll notice, that it's only five, my maximum number again is 5% per year. So why is that? Well, that's, this was done by economists and they recognize how many buildings are you going to retrofit in one year? So we have existing capital, it's called. And this capital, they're saying we're only able to retrofit 5% of all the buildings in the world in any given year. And so it will again take time for us to put this, uh, get this really into it. And you can see here that this will affect the energy intensity of the gross domestic product. And we can look at other graphs as well, like end consumption by end use. This is a pretty cool graph. And uh, you can see here that um, as we increase efficiency, our buildings and industry really came down. Our transportation hasn't done much and, and uh, yeah, the fuel rather, we're using electricity, more electricity too now because of our carbon tax. Uh, anything else? Anyone wanna talk about cars? Or is there, let's see, what about home builders? I'm read, trying to read the chat. Yeah, I think Cindy's question did have, uh, or her request, be interested in seeing the potential impact of greater energy efficiency in buildings and transportation. Okay, so let's hit up transportation. And again, we're making much more efficient uh, cars and trucks, but again, and other types of transportation. And we did get, look at that, we're down to 1.8 degrees. And this is increasing or decreasing the energy efficiency of vehicles, shipping, air travel, and transportation systems. So energy efficiency includes things like hybrid cars, expanded public transportation, and ways that people can get around using less energy. So uh, these things will uh, improve public health as well as save money. And this would be a one that I'd like to go, I'm gonna flip from the graph and look at our more information. And you know, we look here at transportation, what does this affect? As a matter of fact, this affects the red. So let's take a look at uh, that graph here. We'll replay it quickly. And you'll see that here's where we made an effect on uh, our oil use which is really gasoline for us. And because that emits greenhouse gases, we uh, have fewer emissions there. We have uh, less air pollution that went down again here. If you'd like to see it by source, that's kind of what it looks like there. So each of them comes down. Um, natural gas doesn't uh, emit particle particulate matter. So that's not a, a bio that's not in this particular graph. So, wow, 
And we moved this and we're still only at 1.8. So we've barely made it uh, into the zone that we want. Um, is there, Ryan, did that answer the question? Is there something else? Yeah, yeah, I think it was just to, to look at some of these effects of transportation and building sources. And we did have another follow-up question, uh, specifically the construction industry. Uh, is there potential to increase, you know, the minimum requirements for energy efficiency and in, in building new buildings? Um, any legislation in the construction industry? Um, not sure if collectively on this call there are people who could help with some of the answers to that. Yeah, I'm not familiar with any federal legislation on that, although uh, I am definitely not an expert and, and definitely will not pretend to be the most up to date. Uh, personally, I look at that as more of a local issue and local zoning laws. Um, you know, I hear, was it New York City that new buildings or California, new buildings need to have green roofs on them or solar panels. So there's legislation like that, which is insisting that may not only energy efficient and of course, whatever insulation you're supposed to have that increases efficiency uh, windows. So it's in zoning laws, I think that you're going to see most of that. But we can also electrify things. So I just read in New York State, they're working on uh, legislation, no more natural gas to homes. I at least heard some community, some uh, advocates discussing that. So what if we got rid of natural gas in our homes? If those of you, I used to have a natural gas uh, stove. I would miss it terribly. I, my house is currently heated by gas. But what if we all could switch to heat pumps to geothermal? And then again, we've dropped oil, which is used for heating in many homes. And uh, we've increased again our, um, our renewable resources, like mostly solar and wind. So uh, we can electrify buildings as well, but I think that's mostly done through local legislation right now. Uh, do we have this in New Jersey zoning laws? I don't know. You'd have to look in the different regions. I'm sure it's by city and county as yeah. well. I don't think New Jersey has any laws on that right now. <laughs> so uh, another thing I do want to point out though is what about electrifying cars? The definite trend around the world is electric cars. When I speak at uh, school groups and all, I tell these kids that you, when you are my age and I'm turning 60 this month, when you are my age, you will not be driving a gas powered car. One of the best things, in my opinion, from COP26, it was pretty disappointing when they did the international conference to discuss climate change, but uh, the UK announced that they're gonna stop selling fossil fuel cars, I think in 2035. Other countries have made other similar commitments. And if you wanna know the truth, that is what's driving the American automobile uh, companies finally to start promoting their electric cars because if they don't make electric cars, they're gonna be out of those markets. And uh, so for the first time, you realize that for the first time and 20 took till 2021 for any of the major mark, uh, car manufacturers, at least in our markets to advertise electric cars, they've had them and they've at least had hybrids other than Toyota that I know of and I guess uh, Leaf was advertised a little, but really no Ford, no Chevy and no Dodge or uh, anything uh, really promoted their own electric cars. And I'm gonna guess that about half of us on this line tonight might be driving a hybrid. I know I am. And my husband actually got himself an all electric vehicle and bought a Bolt and we really love it. So uh, I highly, you know, I tell people why not be a trendsetter rather than a, a trend follower. But again, the same thing with uh, transportation, even if I push this all the way to the top, I just want to point out um, that even if we electrify 100%, uh, first of all, you have to understand that we can only go 5% or so a year. Again, cars last for 15 years. And so it'll take uh, that much time to, to turn it over. And the model, uh, agrees and accounts for the fact that aircraft and ocean going shipping right now, we don't have the technology to, um, to actually electrify that. Uh, I know that there are lots of experiments and lots of, um, what do you call it? Proof of design, prototypes. 
uh, electric, uh, I've seen an electric helicopter, electric airplanes, very cool, but of course they're not production. So here we could add it up and you can see how the percentage, it gets up to close to hundred. And we're still only down to 1.6 though. So again, if I go back and we look at all this, we see, uh, look at everything we've changed so far. It's a, it's a lot. As somebody mentioned population growth. I do want to touch on it because we don't have to, it doesn't bother me. If, if the world, this is on a prediction, just so you know, uh, that the United Nations is predicting that by uh, 2100, there'll be 10, we at 10.9 billion people on the planet. And this is going by the UN scenario range. So if we have fewer, of course, everything will uh, be reduced a little bit. You can see the energy demand over there at the end of the century. And if we have more people, we're gonna have uh, more of everything. So that's pretty much what, that hap what happens with population growth. That's just assuming a different rate. Did I, anything else here? Susan, I'll just say we have a, maybe a few minutes until 8.15 if you want to spend some time to debrief. Um, I don't know if it's in the model per se, but one question I have is um, whether it accounts for the current energy demands of producing a lot of the electrified goods. Um, so you think of some of the cars and, and mining for the batteries and where do we get the lithium, things like other heavy metals, questions like that. Is there a way that you can model that because as intensive as it is now, you would suspect we'll find ways to make it more efficient over time. Uh, well, they use, I, yes. Um, all of these different, uh, in, in getting energy supply or in getting, uh, creating electrification or energy efficiency, they really do use the full life cycle of these materials. So um, just to give you an idea, I'm just flipping to oil. It's in, discourage or encourage drilling, refining and consuming oil for energy. So it also talks about transporting it as well. So just to give you an idea, all these different sources and things, it does take into consideration all of those things. And you can see that if you wanna read their 300 page reference manual goes into that. Um, I see somebody asked about new carbon option, zero carbon options. And that's talking, there are many people, we, you know, hydrogen, I heard somebody say hydrogen is still only 30 years away or 10 years away. And maybe we'll get to hydrogen one day or possibly fusion. I know that they're working in many places around the world, they're still working on fusion. And so the point is that maybe there are a lot of people that say maybe one of these things is gonna be a breakthrough. So what happens, you know, and how does that play? And you'll notice if we get a new carbon breakthrough, it replaced some of our renewable, other renewable resources. Uh, but again, this takes time. I want you to see that there's a delay. If somebody announced in the New York Times tomorrow that they had a successful fusion um, uh, breakthrough and they're going to make a reactor, just how many people on the world are going to be able to get their energy from it? You know, it's going to take a long time to develop. So that's what uh, that's all about if we have that. And even so, it didn't drop our temperature by that much either, because again, it's, it's relatively not much. So I, I'm going to actually take this. And if you go up to the top right, you can always copy your scenario uh, just so you can see it. And then uh, if you click on that, that will get you to the exact screen we're on here. And I just want to say before I turn this off, I'd like to go debrief for a couple minutes. I have a few more slides, just a few to talk about. But what do you see on the screen? Like, were we able to do it in just one move or two moves? What did it take to get us down here? Well, I would just say, I think, you know, something that we just have to keep reminding ourselves is this is a global model and we're talking about everybody having to do this everywhere. And the reality is that, you know, one of the things that's really hurt us in the COP, you know, uh, meetings and climate negotiations is that we have, you know, countries that 
are very much in disagreement about what is the equitable way in which, you know, the, the burden of reducing CO2 and other, you know, gas emissions should be shared. And I um, think that is going to be a difficult kind of conversation and, and hurdle to uh, overcome. Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, there's one of the things of the Paris Accord was that the developed countries were supposed to be donating a billion dollars a year to help the developing countries to get clean energy right from the start, because there are still literally hundreds of millions of people on this planet, particularly in uh, South Sudan, uh, south of the Saharan Desert and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, that's the word I was looking for, in Southeast Asia. Uh, there are people that still don't even have power like we have. It's a cold outside. I don't know about you, but I'm very comfortable in my house. Uh, I got it set at 66 degrees. We keep it cold here. But, uh, you know, we have the energy. It's just a matter of going to the thermostat and hitting it a few times for me to get comfortable. What about all those people that don't have these luxuries that we have, actually? And that, that was a great point that you brought up. Absolutely. And uh, and, but the Paris Accord did say that everyone's willing to put in this money. They haven't been paying it. COVID didn't help. Of course, that's the excuse to stop paying everything. Uh, although some of it's warranted, of course. Um, but what do you see about all these sliders? Didn't it, can you agree? Somebody mentioned it earlier. It does, there is no silver bullet here. There's definitely no silver bullet. We have to do everything or a lot. I mean, it's more than just buying an electric car. It's more than uh, stopping using natural gas in your house. So um, I'm going to stop sharing that. I'm going to very quickly uh, bring this up one more time. And um, uh, let me see, I'm gonna shrink this. There you go. And I just wanna, ask you, so looking at this, part of this is how do you feel? You know, how do you feel about where we are? But what, what do you think if we could achieve that 1.6 degrees? Wouldn't that be cool? You know, how, how does, how, can you, somebody put in the chat, how you're feeling right now? When I put up the slide at a school, the kids would go, I feel third from the left, fourth from the right. I'm hoping you guys can actually use the words for your feelings rather than <laughs> tell me which emoji. <laughs> this shows you what a generation gap we have. I know I feel hopeful myself. That's why I do this. Because I hope that if enough people work together, then we'll actually achieve this. Oi, depressed. <laughs> yeah, some of it's depressing, I agree. This is a big issue, which is why we need to act. It's daunting, but there's a level of behavior change that isn't fully included in the model. Well, behavior change is, is one of the pieces that we need to do. This is mostly actions and policies on a global level, so. But that brings me to um, the last part. I'm gonna actually skip, I, I, uh, so I'll just jump to the last uh, thing here. Um, what are the main lessons in case you didn't get it on your own? We can still avoid some of the worst impacts of climate change, but there's no one magic solution. Many of our solutions actually offer co-benefits to mankind and the environment, which is great like getting off of these fossil fuels for transportation. I would love clean energy on these highways. Most solutions do raise equity concerns. I touched about it. You guys just mentioned we need participation everywhere and we need to start now. And so I'm just gonna ask you uh, my ending questions. What can you do as an individual, as a community, as a region, as a country? to help us meet uh, this amazing goal of the Paris Accord and to keep global warming down. And I agree with you, it will take policy and it will take law and regulation and it will take cultural change and behavior change. 
You know, uh, there is the citizens climate lobby. You can join right now. That's not a perfect organization. I am not in it. Just so you know, I don't. So I just studied their climate, their carbon tax law, but they're great. They work to meet with legislature, legislators constantly. Um, I'd love for you guys to take this En-ROADS and show it to your partner, your child, your husband and play with it just to have a conversation because that is how we're going to raise awareness. And that is how we're going to, uh, to change behavior and interest and get people to talk to their legislators. We can do things on a community level and an individual level and a region and a country. And hopefully that will all add up to the world. And so um, that's pretty much all I had. I'm gonna stop sharing. So maybe I can see some of your faces now. And if you have any other questions or comments, uh, we have got a few more minutes. We can um, continue the conversation if you like. And you can find out more about me again. I see my husband, we just Google my uh, website. So. Yeah, one, one thing that we didn't necessarily talk about, but um, when, when you put up the little thing about what can we do as an individual or, or community, um, food, is, food is a big thing. There's, there's a lot that can be done with where we get our food from, how we get our food. Um, I know there's at least one farmer on this talk, and, and so I would make a plug for local, you know, trying to get your food locally. As you said, Susan, uh, transportation is a big component of emissions and trucking or train, you know, sending freighting food across the country um, when there are options nearby could make a big difference. Actually, well, they find that. that's not one of the biggest concerns, though. It turns out that if we can remove our waste, so I've been studying this a little, and actually ways to reduce. So, so there are lots. Well, I'll stop sharing there because this really doesn't show what I want. But there are lots of ways in agriculture that we can change um, our ways. And one is just to improve our crop system. And that's partly regenerative thoughts, uh, regenerative farming. And I did, that's why I jumped over there, but I came back. There is a slider I can move for soil sequestration of carbon, but at most it will uh, remove five gigatons per year. But of course, regenerative farming we can do. We need a more, rather than moving your crops, how about just eating a more plant-based diet? You know, you heard of Meatless Mondays. We do that now in my family. Now we got Meatless Mondays and Wednesdays. So it doesn't mean nobody says to cut off anything. By the way, maybe be a little less of a consumer, you know, keep something that doesn't look exactly perfect. Do you really have to keep up with the Joneses, you know? Uh, I try to get my kids, don't buy it if you don't need it. Sometimes I am successful, sometimes I'm not. So, uh, so all those things, great bringing it up for food. Thank you, Ryan, because I really wanted to discuss that. And by doing those three things, um, and there's also the Lancet has a report on the Lancet diet for a healthy, uh, so more sustainable uh, agriculture. And I can, I have to find that link, Ryan, but I'll get it for you in a couple minutes. Um, that discusses changing the whole agricultural system of the world. There are many reports. I know Columbia University has been studying it. There's a, an organization called the Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, it's out there and we reduce agricultural waste as well as uh, fertilizer usage, transportation. We do reduce that and that does make an impact. Don't get, I don't mean to belittle it. And of course we reduce if we don't use live, have it takes less space and resources to grow fiber than it does to grow meat. So we will also reduce the amount of land we need for agriculture if we go to a, a more plant-based diet. So thank you very much, Ryan, for bringing that up. Anything else by chance? Is it possible to get this model just, just for New Jersey? No. <laughs> um, what you can do, they have another model. Uh, En-ROADS um, is global. They had something called uh, C-ROADS. And that 
all that did, well, I don't, shouldn't say all of it. I'm really not that familiar with it because it per doesn't interest me personally. That was how much does each region and I think country have to contribute uh, in their goals for reducing their greenhouse gas emissions in order for us to make these numbers. So you could look at that, but that gives you a number and then we still have to figure out how to do that number. And that's what En-ROADS is about, which is what I'm focusing on, what actual actions rather than pledges. Because also, you know, we're pushing our, I gotta tell you sometimes businesses, I've been writing to businesses, I get that gum toothpicks. So, you know, they're plastic. I know wood is probably better for the environment, but the plastic, um, this is where I'm telling you I'm not a crazy, you know, but they came, they come with all these uh, boxes and I don't need so much packaging. So I wrote to them and I said, why are you giving me all this packaging? And by the way, is it recyclable? So that's a way of a consumer letting these people know that they want something different. And we just started buying, my daughter's 21 and she's home from college, which is wonderful. And so we've been making gin and tonics on occasion and we bought tonic water. And I think it's, uh, Adina, if you're still on, type what the brand is. But one of them has gone uh, totally to paper and glass. And I don't wanna say the wrong one. Thank you, Seagram's, that's my daughter. And so just go and it's glass and it's paper, even the thing holding the six pack. No, Adina, wait, I didn't wanna promote the wrong one, shoot. Anyway, when you go to the grocery store and you look at the in the soda aisle, go check it out because uh, because Dina, can, yeah, never mind. Anyway, because they stopped using plastic except for the bottle caps, which is so cool. So uh, this week I'm going to be writing them an email so we can have effects on businesses as well as governments. And if people, we got to speak, we got to talk to our friends. Heck, if it, if you want to do me a favor, nicely get your friend to stop leaving their car idling. Why the heck do you have to leave your car idling? I get it to warm it up when it's 20 degrees outside. I get that. But when it's 60 degrees out, really? Why does your car have to be running? Anyway, yeah, boxed water, bottled water. We don't do bottled water in this house. We use renewable. Uh, some of our renewables are plastic, but some of them are reusable rather. Most of them are metal. So we're coming to the end of the order. Thank you, it's definitely Schweppes, she said. <laughs> Schweppes, Schweppes, buy Schweppes mixers. All right, so uh, that's our plug for today. I wish they gave us a consideration <laughs> for that commercial, but no way. Uh, any other questions, comments? I wanna thank you again very much for coming and joining me. This has been a lot of fun. I think so anyway, I hope you did too. Yeah, and, and while people are thinking any final questions, I just wanted to thank you all for signing on tonight. Um, certainly thank you to Susan. Uh, I did play around with this model beforehand and boy, did I, I miss a lot of functions, uh, a lot of features. So um, I had no idea at some of those little buttons, how much they could expand and, and what sort of customization there was. Um, so thank you for that and, and for kind of guiding us through this discussion. Thank you. There's my direct email address if you want to throw it in there, but you, there's a contact page on my website too. And if you go through my website, that'll throw you on my own email list. Uh, right now I'm scheduled to speak next in March at the Ethical Culture Society of Bergen County. I'm actually going to be doing something on composting and green landscaping, but I'm not really a perfect expert on that. So there may be some of you that might know even more than me, in which case feel free to give me your information and I'll contact you and you can help me my research. Anyway, so again, uh, do I see a farmer there? Like, what's your name? Uh, Matt, is it? Were you the farmer? Regardless, do you know about this? Sorry. Well, I've worked on a lot of farms, but I'm not a farmer. <laughs> um, I just wanted to clarify that um, I put, I put a, in the chat box, I'm giving a talk in a week. Uh, it's virtual, it's free. And there's a little bit of overlap. Um, I've been on this issue uh, on and off for like 45 years. Uh, so I've seen a lot of ups and downs and developed some uh, couple of interrelated things, um, things that we're not doing that we can be doing. And you've covered quite a bit, few of them today. But also I think uh, on the, on the uh, obstacle side, 
Um, the ones that are pretty well known are, you know, certain uh, villains, entities, certain senators and so forth that are very well known. Um, I'm not going to cover that, but I think there's other things, uh, problems in the way we think about these issues. And again, some of which we, we overcame today uh, as examples, for instance, that climate change is a side issue. Well, clearly it's not, or that a watershed association does not get involved in climate change. And I fought that battle for years uh, and clearly you've overcome that one. Uh, and so these, but I've also discovered over the 45 years, many other things that I think are getting in the way based upon how we think. Uh, and so that's partly what I'm gonna be talking about also. A couple of examples. Um, we didn't talk that much, at least directly about sequ carbon sequestration. It came up a little bit. Uh, uh, with trees and so forth. Uh, when I've talked about sequestration, when I'm teaching courses, uh, some of the professors have said, we can't talk about sequestration because if we do that, it'll take the, uh, the, the urgency away from reducing carbon. And my, my take on that is sometimes you have to you know, do both. And once you get there, you can come up with better and worse ways to do sequestration, but you have to have a conversation. And it's just a, a lot of these things that I feel are getting in the way of where clearly we have to go. So that's gonna, what I'm gonna be covering next Tuesday. And carbon sequestration is an important, also an important aspect of it. I just, it doesn't seem to come up. That's why I love these, things. I just go with the flow when I can. But one of the pieces that's a problem with it is it isn't up to scale. Uh, so the, the amount, of amount of carbon that we're actually able to capture right now isn't uh, that significant, but it can be modeled in the, um, in, the mo in the simulator in two ways, one through technological removals and another, it, we'd ha I have to look at it again, but another either in coal or the biological BECCS, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of the sliders. So, so that's an excellent point as well. Anything should be examined, you know? Yeah. And, the other side of the coin, the other side of the coin in carbon sequestration is not cutting down mature trees. Yeah. Um, you know, that's absolutely insane. And yeah, it'll take a long time with, re, you know, reforestation, but you, you first don't want to do any harm by removing forests. And there's a lot, the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, is very much in favor of increasing forest, uh, increasing logging in this country by an enormous amount. So we, we, we stand to lose a lot. I mean, I realize the, the upside is maybe small, but the downside is tremendous if, uh, if they get their way. You know, I, I used to go through life, I was an educator and I'm not really an activist in general, but I'm finding <laughs> more and more that we each have to, there's a, you know, there's a lot of lobbying. And as a matter of fact, with climate change, to, to get back to Matt's point actually, Something I heard is climate change, we are fighting the richest, most powerful organizations in the world. And those are the oil companies. Um, some of the, they're some of the biggest and they're some of the most powerful. I, I heard a rumor and it is just a rumor that they sent over 500 delegates themselves to COP26. So, you know, that was one way to help keep the pressure on all these negotiators to maybe be uh, not as, radical as they might have been or progressive. I think the right word would be progressive there. So who knows? Um, uh, there's the pay up climate polluters. They're trying to push and show how Exxon has been uh, hiding this and they're aiming for suits at the oil companies. They're trying to keep them out of federal court, but that's some advocacy that's happening and, um, and you know, hoping it to, to go the way of the uh, tobacco companies. So, um, a lot of information and a lot of issues. Yeah, Matt? Oh, no, you're muted. You're muted, Matt. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. <Got it. laughs> Sorry. Um, I agree with that, but I think we should, we should start to complement the critique of businesses that deserve it with those that deserve our praise. And so there's, you know, uh, relatively new businesses, not the renewable companies, but even beyond those 
that I think are beginning to see the future and are as scared about it as, as some of us are and are trying to do the right thing, you know, lobbying for the right legislation, making some of the, some of the changes internally. And I think there's a place for environmentalists to support those companies also. Absolutely, like I said, writing emails, I'm gonna write emails to whichever tonic water that was uh, this week, thanking people for doing it, saying you support them. I, I agree, buying these products, my one daughter only buys shoes from this place that makes them out of reused uh, water bottles. So, uh, you know, doing things like that, it may cost a few dollars extra, they don't last quite as long, but it's, it, it's something, so. We want to do positive and negative. That's why I'm here. Let, let's focus on the positive, you know, too. So, um, oh, what a, excellent place. What a, what a good note to, to end on, focusing on the positives. And now I agree, you know, I was always told, vote, vote with your wallet. That's a, a good way to, to uh, communicate the things that you like and, and, you know, by default, the things that you don't prefer. Um, so... Just in the interest of time, I, I did want to wrap this up. I, I appreciate the, the discussion and, and Susan, your willingness to, to keep the conversation going. Um, but with that being said, I want to respect everybody's time. And, and again, just thank you all for, for coming out tonight. And uh, Susan's uh, contact information has been shared in the chat. If you want to copy that right before, um, you can always uh, reach out to us. I'll probably send out a, a follow-up email to attendees. But Ryan, can I ask Susan one quick question? It's Deborah. Um, how, but can just, you, can you, but just yeah, a go, list. Sure. I just wanted a list of, of, of your companies that are doing these fabulous things because I would like to send emails in support and thank them and also send these companies out to my network of people so they're aware and then can do the same thing. Uh, how about I get you that email to um, Ryan, because I don't have a list prepared. That's a great question. Uh, just so you know, there's a new, it's just evolving ESG ratings of companies, um, environment, social, and governance. It's a new way of looking at companies aside for in addition to profits, because that's part of our thing. You could look at uh, books by Kate Rawworth, Kate Rawworth uh, Zero, uh, no, The Donut Economy, which is goes towards zero waste. So all those things are great. I'll try, Deborah, to get you a list, though. Uh, Thank you. Sure. Yeah, if you share something with me, I can certainly pass it along. Will do. Well, very good. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, have a good night. And for, for those of you who signed up for our email list, you'll You'll be hearing from us uh, more in the future. So hopefully everybody has a good night. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody.